advance and challenge because the owners of the magazine then said, we have plenty of writers for Mainstream Plus, so we only want you to write for this. So uh, that's what I did, but that was another perception of it. Um, I founded and ran the National Advance and Challenge Convention, so my name was heavily associated with that. And all my diagram books were primarily Advance and Challenge because that was what sold. We didn't need, from me, Mainstream and Plus books. We had the sets and order pamphlets and all. So those are the reasons why I think um, uh, people have, that, have had that misconception. In actual fact, half of all my calling ever since day one has always been Mainstream Plus. And most people don't know that. Uh, my Plus Club in Pittsburgh, which is a dancer-run club, and they hired me way back. I've, I've now been their club caller for 49 years. Uh, when I started calling and traveling, I was interested in Advance and Challenge, but I was also interested in Mainstream Plus, and I quickly realized I couldn't support my traveling calling either one. If I only wanted to call Advance and Challenge, I couldn't travel around a thousand miles or so on a weekend calling only that. And I couldn't do this, and the same with Mainstream and Plus. But if I combined them, now I could get five, six, and seven dances on a weekend. Because the Advanced and Challenge people would adapt and dance to you morning or afternoon, and then you call the Mainstream Plus at night. So that's what I did for 20, 25 years, combining both on the weekends, and that's how I was able to um, be able to afford to be able to travel on on all these weekends. And after you're calling about 52 years, you've been calling more than 52 years, many callers start to slow down, but uh, you still seem to stay pretty active. Yeah, as you said, I'm still calling about 120 dances a year. I have three home programs, um, the Plus Club, uh, my Advanced Club has been going 48 years, my C2 Club just celebrated 50 years last year, and I make four or five trips a year to the East Coast, uh, Washington, D.C., Maryland, New Jersey, New York, um, I call in uh, California every summer for, for three weeks out there, go to Florida in the winter, and miscellaneous other, other dances. And you also have conducted college seminars at schools all over the world. Can you elaborate on this? Yeah, I just, I just love working with callers, uh, mainly because the opportunity doesn't nearly present itself as often as it does with, <coughs> excuse me, with calling from Mainstream Plus. So I will give up any dance to be able to do a, a caller seminar. So my first caller clinic was in 1972, and I just uh, really loved it. So any place I would go to call dances, then I would contact the local caller association, say, are you interested in a, um, in a, in a caller clinic? And, and that's how I was able to get a number of bookings that way. And you were chairman of the Call Up Challenge Committee for about 30 years at the beginning. How did you mesh those programs with you know, inside of Colorado and outside of Colorado. Well, the history of, of the challenge program, it, the word challenge did not exist in 65, <coughs> by 67 it did. So, it's, and nobody knows how and where it changed, but somewhere in 66 the osmosis changed over to, to challenge. So, there were no lists then, no lists anywhere. Every caller did whatever he wanted, whatever program he was calling. So in 1973, I decided we needed to have uh, some uniformity. We needed to have a challenge list of calls. And so I sent out letters to all the challenge callers and said, give me your thoughts on what should be on a challenge list. Got hardly any replies, maybe five or six. I said, well, this is no good. We're going to have the list. How do I get input? Because it's not going to be the Ed Foot list. It's going to be the consensus of all the callers. So I sent out another letter, and I said, based on my first response, here's the list of calls. You have 30 days to respond before it's published. Whomp, everybody responds. <laughs> and this has proven a very good lesson for me in life, not just for square dancing and in color lab, but for anything in life. Brainstorming is fine to get input and ideas, but it takes a long, long time. And if you want to get something done, you say, here's the way it's going to be. You have 30 days of response. We respond and you always get the response. Because people know it's going to go out with or without their comment. And, and it's worked great for my, while I was on the, uh, running the challenge convention. That's how I always did it. Challenge, con ch or not the challenge, con con challenge committee. Um, challenge committee is always involved with definitions all the time. And still so today. Uh, 
you put out the definition, you say, this is the way it's going to be. You've got 30 days to respond. Everybody responds. Works great. And you and Marilyn built your home in 1969 for square dancing. Tell us about that. Yeah, we, um, I got married in 68, and uh, we decided we wanted a house. We looked around and quickly found there were no houses where you could square dance, so we decided to build our own house. And we wanted to be able to have dances there, so we decided to build our final house first, rather than build a starter house, another one, and keep going up the line. We just built our final house first, and we don't have to worry about it. So we got this high-powered architect in Pittsburgh to design the house, and um, uh, he comes back with a plan, and it was no good. I mean, we didn't like the way the kitchen was, the living room, the basement had the stairs coming right down into the middle of the basement. There was no room to dance. But what do we know? We're just young kids. We don't know how to tell this architect who was a big name how to do his job. So I'm stuck. So one night after my dance in, in 1967, I guess it was, one of the people who danced with me was a plumber. And he had a secret desire to be an architect. So I was complaining about all this. So he took one of these little square napkins and drew on the napkin his <laughs> thoughts for the plan for our basement and first floor. Took these two little napkins to this high-powered architect. He says, yeah, never thought of that. <laughs> Redid the blueprints, turned out perfect. Turned out perfect. Another dancer designed our second floor, and that was how our, our house got built. We have finished. Our basement is a finished room with a separate outside entry so people can run their own dances if we're not home. And the hall is uh, 28 by 32 with one post right in the middle. We can dance four squares very easily, six squares where we reverse the heads and the sides. And there's an interesting follow-up story. Uh, 14 years later, uh, I'm out in the front yard doing something, and across the street lived a, a lady, real estate sales lady. And we knew her just to say hello, but I'd never been in her house, she'd never been in ours, we just would wave and say hello. So I'm out there working in the front yard, she's out there, so we get talking, and somehow we're talking about houses. And I mentioned, in, in my house I have this, and it's just, I know everything that's in your house. And I go, well, how's that? She said, because your architect runs classes for real estate people, and he uses your blueprints as the example of how a house should be built. <laughs> and your calling career in Square Dance Leadership World has been nothing short of amazing. Your impact on other callers and dancers and the activity as a whole has been kind of subtle and steady and enormous. Anyway, we want to thank uh, both you and your wife, Marilyn, for all that you've done for dancers and callers and for making the activity a, a much better and more rounded uh, activity. Ladies and gentlemen, a nice hand for Mr. Ed Foote. We also need to thank him for the perfect way to build a house. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> Blueprints. Our, our next caller, a uh, personal friend, been a friend for a very, very long time to me, and uh, had a lot of fun with him. Uh, Ken Bauer is from Palm Desert, California, and I've talked to Ken over the phone about this interview for a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about how he got started square dancing and where, but uh, as you know, Ken's been a recording artist for a long, long time. We're going to talk a little bit about that. So, Ken, uh, when did you begin square dancing? Uh, first of all, Ed, you have a square dance on your basement. I'll be coming through there in June. <laughs> 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 uh, I actually started calling uh, in 1962. Uh, we uh, took lessons in 61, and, and uh, I had, had voice lessons for uh, years before that when I was younger. And so it was pretty easy for me to get into square dancing, and I called my first uh, square dance college. I called my first full dance in May of 62. May of 62. Isn't it amazing how all of us can tell us and tell you when their first dance was? Mine was January 7th, 1967. I can just tell you. Uh, you grew up in Ottumwa, Iowa? Uh, yes. And you started calling in Des Moines, right? Yeah, well, I moved to Des Moines this week. Okay. To dance. All right. 
I, I will tell you this. I started calling in 1966, and in 1968, I went to my first national convention. It was in Omaha, Nebraska in 1968. Ken had just recorded what I thought was his first singing call, but he told me later it's his second. He, he re recorded a song for Norm Merbach on Blue Star called First Thing Every Morning. And it was an amazing record for Ken. At that time, if you had a hit record, it could make you a star. And that record literally made Ken a star in Omaha, Nebraska. Tell them a little bit about that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, that was about the third recording I did. Uh, the others, I, won't, I don't want you to know the name of it. <laughs> Back then, uh, a lot of square dancers, uh, and the square dancers at that time purchased records. They would buy buy records, and that's where we got the big sales from. And, uh, it wasn't just that record that did it. By the time that record came out, I also, uh, 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 when I uh, left Blue Star and uh, Murdoch, uh, he graciously let me go. He was very good about it. And we met a fellow named uh, Don Franklin. You all remember Don Franklin? Wagon Wheel Records. And that, and that really is what helped me. I got a lot of experience uh, for, in the recording business from him and also uh, a lot of the guys that I got to work with were Jerry Haig, um, Burl Main, and of course Gary Shumate come along. I'm going to back up just a little bit though to that Blue Star recording. It was a, for everybody at that time, at least what, what I was aware of when I went to that convention, we all wore a western shirt and a string tie. Ken Bauer came in in a blue blazer with a white turtleneck sweater. I'd never seen that before. And he had, he had perfect hair. And how many singing calls did you do at that convention? You said that's the only one you did. Yeah, uh, yeah, I did that with Marshall Flipple. Uh, he also did that with him. You did that with him. <coughs> you, but you did first thing every morning at that Omaha convention. Oh, you sang the Omaha. I yeah, thought you did the first no, festival. Like, no, yeah. uh, That's the only singer call you sang. I guess it was. Yeah. Yeah. Now, <laughs> on the way home, he got so many requests to uh, call dances. Talk about your trip home because you couldn't stay awake. Oh, well, that was, <laughs> that was party years, Jerry. <laughs> he and Dee were sorting through all the requests they had to, for contracts. Well, what had happened was it, it, it was getting to the point that, uh, um, that uh, my job, I worked for a, a company called Coles, uh, Coles Broadcasting Publishing Company. I was a printing president for them, uh, Look Magazine. And I had a I had a nice job with them, and, and I uh, they, they were awfully good to me. They let me have a few days off to go call, and I was very fortunate to at that time I could jump on it. I'll get to the point in a minute. I could jump on a plane and run out to, and call a dance in Boston, and and be back the next day in time to go to work. So it worked out pretty good. But after a while, it becomes it becomes where both your calling and your job uh, starts to. Uh, start declining so we knew we had to do something and we pretty much decided not not to do much more with the square dance calling <clears throat> pardon me but uh, after that convention i had booked uh, uh, about enough dances to keep us going for a year yeah that's uh, what i wanted you to hear but, but, but back back then if you just hung your shingle out you had 30 squares yeah then Ken went on to record for Don Franklin Wagon Wheel Records, and it included uh, Gary Shoemaker, Burl May, and Jerry Hay. And Don kind of changed our, our record recording industry because he took tunes that hadn't been done before, took popular tunes, Mississippi, some of those, and he used horns on records, and I think that's one of the first times I heard horns on records. After Wagon Wheel was no longer active, though, Ken Gary, Burl Main, and Jerry Haig started a company we all know as Chaparral Records. And to my knowledge, it's the first record company that produced records or had musicians in Nashville. They went to Nashville. And they, they knew a famous fiddle player who used to be in Dallas, Texas, in the Texas area, by the name of Johnny Gimbel. Johnny was in, in uh, Nashville at that time. And they got Johnny to produce Chaparral records for them, and he got them some famous musicians. 
uh, on their label. They had Charlie McCoy, who played Maltar, Floyd Kramer, Bobby Thompson, to name a few. Talk a little bit about Johnny Gimbel and Chaparral Records. Uh, well, Johnny Gimbel, uh, the reason we contact him is because he was actually a square dancer. He had taken lessons and danced for several years. Paul Markham, out in Tennessee, of course, Nashville area. <clears throat> And uh, he really had knowledge in the square dancing and uh, the, the proper beat, the, the proper things to put. Uh, uh, we had horns. If you did horns on this, this is fine, but you couldn't add this with it because it did not go well with that. So the knowledge that he gave us was tremendous. Uh, and uh, then he helped us pick out the guy, uh, the guy that mixed our music for us. And he, he was fabulous, just fabulous. And that really helped us get a good start. But I think the thing that really helped us also was, uh, of course, square dancers buying the music. And all of us guys were full-time callers on the road. So we went everywhere in the U.S. We covered it with our music. And, and uh, uh, at that time, people say, where can we buy that record? So it helped us tremendously. And um, Johnny would, uh, uh, he knew when we had a good song and he'd put a lot of stuff into it. And I think we had a pretty good seller. I, uh, in the first couple of years, uh, one record sold over 30-some thousand. That was, yeah, there was something about you, baby, I like, yeah. I think. Yeah, so was, Yeah, that was, that. I didn't record that. No, I didn't record that. That was my, yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was, see, my, this is what I wanted to do. Yeah, well, it was my song. I, he, uh, uh, we, he was out to my house calling for us out in Hammond, California. We had a, we worked in a travel trailer park there have guys come through on occasion and, and Jerry had called there and afterwards uh, he wanted to go down to, it was a little bar in our town it was called, uh, it was called uh, the stables the stables bar and the guy that the guy there's a friend I didn't know him well I don't have been there a couple times and he said uh, uh, he played a, a one-man band and he played this song something about you being life and I said hey that'll make a good song and he said oh yeah I really would so uh, we got a hold of Johnny and somehow he got the music behind it and uh, made the music and it was fabulous very good song it was the biggest seller we had and Jerry Haig my dear friend I love him to pieces baby bliss that's what I called him. He cried tears until I gave him that song. <laughs> so a couple months later, it wasn't long, long until we had another one come out there. It was called uh, Rockin' in Rosie's Boat. Gary Shoemake found that somewhere. And Mr. Haig played Poor Boy to him too. And he got that song. <laughs> and, and it doesn't end there. <laughs> And Hank is not here to defend himself. <laughs> We'd be happy. He'd be happy to come here and say, that's right. I got it <laughs> he you. would, as a matter of fact. But then I, I record some music for, uh, or I got the music from Buddy Weaver. And it was called uh, the Red Red Robin song. Really good. And I told, I told uh, Gary Shoemaker, I said, I'm never giving it. I'll never give Hank another piece of music. He never brings one to us, and he takes the good stuff. That's his story. <laughs> and he got that one away from me. <laughs> Forty years later. <laughs> but he did a fabulous job, and he was a really tremendous seller. Yeah. Uh, Chaparral Records, and I'm sure all of you guys do use a lot of those records. I know I do. Uh, then what, this brings us to, you moved away from... Uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and I think 1972, you went to him in California. 73. 73. And how did you became the resident caller at a resort there in Hammond, and how did that come to be? Well, uh, Johnny Clare, uh, uh, Johnny was one of the first guys to hire me to do a weekend festival uh, out in Clare, out in Wyoming. Rivers, River, no, what river? It's your home. Raleigh. 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 Raleigh's Wyoming, yeah. And, uh, uh, he hired me for several years, and uh, that's how I got to know him. Then he, he started doing a thing in Trailer Village in Mesa, Arizona. That We're going to get to one. that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's when, I, when I found out this was a bit. I had called for the fellow that built this park. And that's why I moved to California. I wanted to get off the road. I was on the road full time. And had a young family. I did, yeah. Well, kids went with me. That's, yeah. Oh, did they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, that, uh, I don't know if I can ask this or not. <laughs> I heard this. Why don't you whisper to me first? No. no. 
I heard a story one time that Dee and the kids were picking up cans in a ditch. Is that true? Oh, yeah. It, 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 it. <laughs> <laughs> they were, you mean when the car broke down? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, we, uh, we had a, uh, we, uh, her dad had an automobile dealership and he sold us a car <laughs> and uh, I had to I had to work with Johnny up we were at uh, you and I Burl worked in uh, at Burl's place up on uh, the mountain lighted lantern, lighted lantern. Lighted lantern. and uh, I had to fly out and do something somewhere and, and so Dee took the kids we were going on into California he started working to do that uh, uh, little in California and she got with all the kids and uh, had neighbor kids with us and had uh, two dogs and a cat and I think we had a turtle Gosh. I, I think it was the good days. I'm not sure. But anyway, the car broke down, so she was stuck out there for a long time. It was kind of sad in a way. She, she, uh, she said, I, I said, what happened? Well, they had everything to eat and drink in the car. That wasn't a problem. She, you know what her biggest fear was? She said, I knew somebody had to help us, but I was afraid somebody would stop and help us. <laughs> the uh, Ken's wife, D, is a lot of fun. One night, uh, I was going to stay with Bauer in Palm Desert because I was calling L.A. And I called him up and he said, well, you can't stay with us. I'm calling in Mesa. I said, really? He said, but, but he said, I'm going to drive all the way to San Diego because we got to get on a cruise ship. I said, well, that's, that's good because I'm going to drive all the way back to Mesa because you ain't home. <laughs> so we talked on the phone back and forth as we met each other on I-10. And about 3 a.m. I called, and Dee answered the phone, and she said, Isn't this fun? <laughs> and I didn't call again. <laughs> I, said, I said, What's Bauer doing? She said, He's sleeping, wouldn't you know? <laughs> so I never called back that night. Do you remember that? <laughs> well, I remember that. She has, a, she has an odd way of saying things. I, <laughs> her favorite, you know, I, we, I did the park many years like Johnny did. Johnny showed me how to do it. That's yeah. where I got the idea from. But anyway, uh, I, if you, you have a bad night, I've only had one. Uh, it was over. It was over spin chain through, and of course my wife went to every session, took the money, helped me out, uh, and I was calling. It was the advanced group. It's back when I was calling a lot of advanced, and and I called spin chain through and closed the whole floor right now. And uh, uh, so I called a second time and did it again. Well, I just, I didn't throw a fit, but you could tell I was mad because the veins were popping out in my neck, you know. How, so I went back and, and my wife was a dancer at the time. She had danced and her square was even broken down. And so, and she's back there counting stuff in the back. And I said, you see that? I said, I, these people, I said, I called Spin Chain Do and I lost the whole floor. She says, well, maybe they're having a bad day. I said, you kidding me? I said, that tw they did twice. And she said, well, maybe things aren't right. What is it? I said, well, for crying out loud, if they want to dance this level, they should know how to do spin chain through. And she said, when's the last time you called it for us? <laughs> Think of that. Yeah, I bet I hadn't called it in two years. Well, and I'm getting really Jerry. Let me tell you what will straighten you out when you're a caller. When you think you're pretty good, you straighten you out. The, the drive's an hour home. Yeah. She gets in the car, you drive along. It's and it's quiet. Quiet. it's quiet. And I'm talking like in tongues, really trying to do this. And pretty soon it comes out. Here's how it goes. My, did we impress ourselves tonight. <laughs> and it's another 45 minutes home. <laughs> I will enlighten you just further. I, the first festival I ever called was in Westmoreland, Kansas, and I took my wife along because that's the only person I was going to know. And partway through the dance, I saw her square up with a guy in the back of the hall, and the squares I had went down, and I looked up and I said, Sharon, who's your corner? And she goes, oh. <laughs> So after the tip, I walked over there and I said, Sharon, you can help me out just a little bit. I said, my this is my first festival, and she said, who are they paying for that statue oh. or me? <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. You've called all over the world. Uh, you know, you've called all over the world. How many? Do you, do you have any idea? Jesus. You know, I don't even know for sure. Right? But you've called Japan, you've called near, called in Australia. China. 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 I, went to, I went to call in Russia. I was supposed to. 86, and you're in a communist country at that time, you're not allowed to gather in groups. They 
good. So uh, then I thought, well, I'll just go on and do it anyway. They're not looking. <laughs> they, uh, they took my passport and said, if we hear of you doing this, you won't get your passport back. That'll stop you from calling. Yeah. <laughs> This is a, a kind of like it. This is a truly amazing calling career. He's traveled all over the world. The recordings and the many, many friends he's made. Uh, my thanks to Dee for sharing you with all of us all these years. And ladies and gentlemen, a nice hand to Ken Bauer. All right. Well, as I said, we have four callers here today, four legends that we wanted to interview. The next two tie in together just a little bit, but I want to start with this gentleman to my immediate left. This is John LeClaire. He's from Riverton, Wyoming originally, and his wife Marge is not here today, but uh, John uh, quit calling about 30 years ago. He retired from calling, but he uh, was a full-time caller for a long, long time, ran weekends early, early on in the days. So John, when did you start calling? I started in 1950. 1950. By the way, John is now 94 years old. Wow. So, okay, and when you started calling, uh, you were in Riverton, Wyoming. Did you have a club there or uh, uh, did you do something before you started calling full time? Uh, yes, I uh, I grew up on a cattle ranch. My folks had a cattle ranch and uh, I had two brothers and uh, we had a large cattle ranch but I figured that uh, with two other brothers I probably wasn't enough there to for me to stay so I was looking for something else to do at the particular time so uh, square dancing came around at about the, about the right time. About the right time. And when, so when did you start calling full time? Right away? Well, now that's a good question because um, I probably started calling full time in 1953. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the things you have to remember, John lived in Riverton, Wyoming, and that's a, that's a very remote area. And when he did traveling, he did lots of miles. John traveled in areas where most of us don't go, except some people that I know. So how far did you travel to dances, John? Well, uh, I had a club that was uh, about 150 miles from my home uh, base. Uh, so I called there once a week. As a matter of fact, when I first started calling, I had four clubs. I had one in Riverton, I had one in Dubois, I had one in Lander. These are all in Wyoming, and I had one in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. That was 150 miles away. So those were long drives at night. And Wyoming doesn't necessarily have the greatest weather, let me tell you. <laughs> okay, now, John has ties to Bob Osgood. Most of us here at Caller Lab are familiar with Bob Osgood in the Sets and Order magazine. And I actually have a record at home that you recorded, I think about 1953, on the Sets and Order label. Did you record for any other companies than Sets and Order, John? Uh, yes, I recorded for Scope and Windsor. Okay. You were not on Old Timer any of those? No. Okay. Um, okay. The other, the other thing that I want you to note, John brought some things along here. He was one of the first to start conducting weekends, uh, and I think they were called dancing holidays, am I correct? Dancing fun. Dancing fun, all right, thank you for correcting me. One of the most popular was held in Rollins, he also held, held one in Laramie, and he had famous people that came to some of the early weekends in the early 50s. Bob and Mib, Becky Osgood came to the weekends in Rollins or Laramie, I think you told me. Yeah, just let me uh, clarify this. I did not, uh, uh, I was not the sponsor of the one in Laramie, it was the Western Square Dance Association. Okay, but Bob and Bev Kiosgood and a Bob and Ginger. Ginger King, it was Bob and Ginger at that time. Okay, Bob and Ginger. Also a couple that came with them, a very, very famous couple, a guy named Chuck and and his wife Dottie Jones. You know Chuck Jones today if you watch cartoons. 
as a creator of Bugs Bunny. And Chuck Jones did a great deal for square dancing, promoting square dancing all over. Chuck Jones made some of the flyers for John. Some of these, we want these back. <laughs> this flyer here was done in 1951 for the University of Wyoming. And it's got Bugs Bunny riding a buck and bronco. And John said, I gotta apologize for this. The guy who was calling with me did some really neat choreography and I wrote it on the flyer. So that <laughs> Who was with you? Do you remember? Pardon? Who was with you then that that you took wrote that down? I, I don't remember really. Okay. Uh, evidently I thought it was quite good. <laughs> anyway, there's another uh, thing right here. Mike, could you hold it up for me, please? In 1972, John LeClaire came to Mesa, Arizona to call in Travel Trailer Village. And Jerry Haig went to Mission, Texas to uh, call a Tropic Star or Peppermint Palace, I don't know which. And then a year later, Ken Bauer went to Hemet, California to work these resorts. Those three guys taught us who work in these parks, how to do it. They created the programs. John created the program here for Travel Trader Village. John, talk a little bit about how they came about and a little bit about calling in the parks for the first time. First, first of all, uh, we were hired, actually we were, <clears throat> a couple by the name of Marge and Ed Crum uh, actually got us a job and uh, uh, they already had the program set up for the year that I signed the contract. And the first year, the cost for the people to dance was 50 cents a couple. Now, it didn't stay at that because before the year was over, we had raised it. But anyhow, to go back and, and think about what, how the prices have changed, uh, at, at the present time, Trailer Village, if you stay overnight, was $4 back in 1971. Now it's $55 a night. If you stay a, a year, it was $400. Now you stay a year, it's $3,600. So t times have changed. But we started at tw uh, 25 cents a person, 50 cents a couple. And then we raised it uh, to 50 cents a person, or a dollar a couple, and a dollar 25 for out-of-park people. But going back in reality, I had a lot of beginner classes where I had over 40 squares of dancers. And I think the reason for this was the fact that we had just gotten through the war, and people had, had a rough time, and they were looking for something to do and square dancing came around at the proper time and, and people were eager to enter into some type of recreation. I think that's exactly right uh, because a lot of our <coughs> dancers who are passing on now all came through World War II. They really did in the Korean War. At, the, at this trailer village, uh, John would bring guys in for specials. These are some of the guys that you worked with, that you brought in? No. Every Sunday night, uh, once a month, we had a uh, caller special, and we brought in some of the top-notch callers around the country. Here are some of the people I just remembered offhand. Marshall Flippo. Is Flip here? Yeah. No. Yeah. Bob Fisk. John Jones. Ken Bauer, Frank Lane, Gary Shoemake, Dave Taylor, Milton Luttrell, and Ron Snyder. Some of those guys are in this room. Why don't you guys stand up so they can see who you are? Milton, John, <laughs> Flip <-o. laughs> And what I want you to understand, uh, a lot of you are aware of the, of the trailer parks in the wintertime, the winter square dance programs that some of us are privileged to be a part of. But John LeClaire, Jerry Haig, Ken Bauer, they created 
the programs that we now enjoy. They made a place for us and showed us how to make it run and how to do it. And I think that's really something. So, John, I thank you for that very, very much. What do you think of that flyer over there? I happen to work in these trailer parks, and I've never seen a woman like that <laughs> by the pool. I haven't seen that. Thank you. Okay. All right. And John explained that the classes were 40 squares frequently. John and Mark <coughs> decided to retire. What year? You decided to retire. What year? Nineteen. Well, I I, I retired in nineteen eighty six, but I had uh, dates that were out on the road, so I actually finished up in nineteen eighty seven. Okay, and he retired because he wanted to do other things. He wanted to uh, have some time, and he and Marge have enjoyed a great thirty years since that time. John uh, and Marge worked at uh, the Suns basketball games, the baseball games as ushers. He's met most of the stars, have you not? Yes, we worked, uh, actually we worked for uh, the uh, Diamondbacks, which is the baseball team, the Phoenix Suns, and also the Dodge Theater. I worked 20 years, Marjorie worked 18 years. I worked uh, uh, nearly 3,000 events in those 20 years. And uh, I had the opportunity to see all the great uh, athletes and uh, all the, uh, uh, like Lady Gaga, and a whole bunch of things that I didn't want to see. <laughs> but uh, it was really something, we, we were always, always interested in sports. So that's the reason we got the job, and we really certainly enjoyed it. But really, uh, super time. Would you not say that's an interesting 94 years? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I talked to John at length here the last couple of years about getting him over for this, and he was consented to do that. So, John, I thank you very much, and if you would, give another nice hand to John. <laughs> Just let me say one thing, if I may, before I finish. Uh, Marjorie uh, sends her best. Uh, she's in assisted living, and she's doing quite well. But she wanted me to uh, say hi to everybody, and uh, sorry she couldn't be here. I do want to say one other thing, that in October, we celebrated our 70th wedding anniversary. Just one thing before I leave, uh, I think I uh, called uh, every, 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 everything that I, uh, I did every job I was asked to do except one. At uh, Lightning Guest Ranch one year, a gentleman from San Diego uh, was one in attendance and he said, I'd like to have you come down to San Diego and call a dance. And I said, oh, I'd probably be happy to, but uh, uh, give me some more information. He said, well, it's at a nudist colony. <laughs> and I said, really? I said, uh, are the people all naked? And he says, uh, yes. And I said, well, how about what, what can I wear? He said, uh, your stockings. <laughs> and that's the only dance I ever turned down. <laughs> but you know what? Looking back, I wish I had have taken it. <laughs> John, I can tell you this, Marshall Flipple still carries the flyer for that dance. <laughs> that's fact. Alright, again, a nice hand for John. interview here is with Paul Moore, his wife Mary. Mary isn't here, is that right? No, she's not. Okay, Paul Moore. And Paul has just completed a book, uh, as I saw it. Uh, it is the life story of Bob and Becky Osgood. And uh, we're not really interviewing Paul. We're going to talk about Bob Osgood, who in my... When, when Jerry asked me to do this session about three years ago, I was 
is this a case of mistaken identity? He's talking to the wrong person. And then I realized I am a proxy for Bob Oscar. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, one, of the, one of the things that I love about our interview with Legends is that we can get on tape and document some of the things that we just talked about with these three gentlemen. And we missed Bob. Bob is gone and we didn't get, get him on tape. Um, Paul has just completed this book and, and I, I was privileged to, to edit part of it or at least to, to go through it. So it, it's been interesting. Bob Osgood, in my opinion, was the most visionary person in the activity by far. Uh, and I'll just go start down through here. It's just some random thoughts that I, I put down. Bob realized early on we had a need for a national magazine, and he created such an order magazine. He saw that we had a need for the National Square Dance Convention. He created the National Square Dance Convention in 1952. In the 60s, he realized that there were no standardized lists. You couldn't call in New York and come out to California and call because they danced different calls. So he, he saw a glaring need for standardization of square dance calls. In order to do that, he saw the, the need for an organization such as Caller Lab. And it was his vision to create Caller Lab, which came about in 1974. Um, those are the things that I saw about Bob. And he had a passion to teach people to square dance in the LA area and all around the world. And he also dealt with a lot of people in the movies, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, John Ford, the Western movie producer. Uh, his neighbor was Gene Kelly. Uh, he choreographed a lot of dances that we see in the old Western movies. And he also had a weekly TV show in LA. So I'm gonna kind of turn this over to uh, Paul to give us a little bit of history of the vision of Bob Osgood. Well, I think what you did is you gave it a nice teaser and everybody wants to know more details about what you already <coughs> talked about by the book. <laughs> but there are things that the book ended up being 600 pages after we cut about 300 pages out. And there are some stories that people probably do not know. Uh, Bob was an outstanding caller in his own right. But somewhere after uh, he started calling, and I think in 1946, uh, he had done some oddball things before that. But in 1946, he was uh, calling while being a national representative uh, and a public relations person for the Squirt. Uh, soft drink company and he found that by traveling for the, the company and they'd pick up the bills that he could go out and dance on Saturday and Sunday, Friday night wherever he happened to be. I had a chance to, to meet people and found out the needs of all of the areas in the country which was almost always well, uh, no common terminology but they did have a common interest in dancing to the music and so he was able to take that but by talking to people all over and they picked his brain is that how you do it in California uh, how, how do ladies get their costumes where can you buy costumes you know, well we don't we make them and uh, he decided that any magazine that he put together should be uh, just a, an information gathering area. He thought of himself as an ombudsman, which meant that people could feed information through him, he could share it, people could respond to it, and he very quickly attracted a, a, a core of writers, uh, and we've already seen the, the Chuck Jones stuff. Chuck wrote a column for uh, Sex and Order magazine for about six years, I think whatever went across Chuck's mind, and you know how the, uh, the Roadrunner goes. That, by the way, Roadrunner was invented by Chuck Jones. Uh, so Bob really wanted to, to be an ombudsman to share information about square dancing, and uh, because of all of that sharing, it led to uh, a number of things where Bob didn't necessarily start the movement, but he's the one who put the energy behind it to make it happen. Uh, Bob had an uncanny ability to have, a, have ideas, have a vision, and in that vision, 
he would get people to believe it was their idea. He, he had an uncanny ability to do that. He, he was the type of, of person who could uh, tell you to go somewhere and you'd look forward to the journey. And you know where the, the somewhere was. <laughs> when, when he had the vision for Collar Lab, uh, sets an order for those of you who are, are newer callers, sets an order, uh, Bob had a Hall of Fame. And I think there were 11 guys in that Hall of Fame, am I correct? Um, or maybe more around 28. But 11 guys he chose to get together to try to form Collar Lab. And he convinced those guys we needed standardization of lists, we needed a, an organization. And as Hall of Famers, it was their job to convince the, the ordinary, the, 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 the club callers, the club callers, that this was the way to go. And that's how it got started. Very true. Uh, but Bob did something before the, uh, uh, the first meeting of the Hall of Fame folk, is he had started this summer dance vacations at a Silomar, uh, a beautiful park up in Monterey, California, right on the coast. And uh, he had started off, he had one session to begin with, 1951, and uh, they sold out 180 dancers. And they were looking for, well, what are we gonna do next year? You know, these same people are gonna to wanna to come back. How do we go ahead and get more? He ran a second week, and it sold out also. And then they decided, let's do a, a weekend session in the winter, and so he was running those three dance sessions. And then because of some other things that went on before, uh, going all the way back to 1961, there was a meeting of callers in Colorado. Uh, Herb Gregerson, I think, was, was the leader on, on that, with uh, oh, Ed Gilmore and, and just another long list of, of great people. And they, they, we need to do something to, to standardize. But a lot of people in the country were against standardization. You don't want to be locked into the box, you know, too much structure. So but it took another 10 years before they could do anything. And then they invited uh, 14, 15 Hall of Fame callers to come to a Bar just on the idea of, you know, we're going to honor you guys for being in the Hall of Fame. And it had the uh, special portraits they'd been painted to, to hang at the uh, Sets and Order Hall. And uh, he conned these guys into showing up at a Bar, partly because the weekend was free. Bob paid the whole bill on that. and. Uh, after Joe Lewis did a, a little roast, and I guess he roasted Marshall pretty good. And, uh, yeah, Flip is back here. He is one of the founding members of, of Colorado. I think there are only two still alive. Yeah. Frank. Flippo and, and Frank Lane are still alive up in Estes Park, Colorado. Uh, unfortunately, Dave Taylor passed away just last year or so. So anyway, there are only two of them left. I'd like to Joe, Lewis, Joe Lewis roasted Flippo. I'd like to You'd like to roast Flippo? Is that right, Bauer? Maybe, maybe we should just have Flippo come up here and we'll start a roast. <laughs> but I'm not sure we can all tell the right stories. But anyway, uh, that uh, 1971 meeting in at Asilomar, just the call, uh, Hall of Fame callers, and then they said, uh, they sent invitations out to a number of people who couldn't make it they would be invited to the next meeting. And the, uh, the growth of Colorado was very uh, slow to begin with. If you attended one on an invitation, then you had the right to suggest someone for the next meeting. You could not invite that person. You could only suggest the name to the board. That's right. And uh, it continued to grow until about 76 uh, when they opened it up that uh, you know, you could nominate two or three people, but to get into Colorado, you needed to be invited by somebody who was a member. By keeping it exclusive, then the reputation of the group uh, grew, and we all like you know, to be a member of the in-group, and Bob knew that. Snob appeal has a lot of weight, and so, 
you know, here you've got all of these Hall of Fame callers, and I want to be part of that group. And it grew quickly. By 1980, they're looking at something like 900 callers having joined, 600 showing up for conventions. And it was uh, basically it was just a, it was Oz good willpower that got people to, to join. Bob was a most interesting guy. How many of you had the pleasure of meeting Bob? Quite a number of you. As such, you all realize that when Bob Osgood would sit down and talk to you, he would actually talk to you, but he would ask you about what's going on in your area. I know Mike Hogan told me, he sat with him in the airport in Nashville, and Mike could not believe that Bob was actually interested in what's going on in Omaha, Nebraska. He did the same with me, and I'm sure with all of you. Uh, he had an uncanny ability to listen and then you would discover some of what you said would show up in a magazine. You may not have your name in there, but Bob listened, and he was a great listener. Well, uh, he, I think, taped every convention or meeting he went to, and there are, uh, I think I still have eight boxes of uh, audio tape. Uh, buddies, how many boxes of cassettes did you do? But he, but he was with me somewhere and, and opened his mouth at the wrong time and so I delivered boxes and boxes of, of cassette tapes. I still have the reel to reels so and they take a few hours each, you know, including repair time because we're talking about tapes going back in the early 50s. Uh, he held conversations with people, you know, and they'd be mailing cassettes or, or reel to reel tapes back and forth and you get a letter from so-and-so, it'll be two sides of a seven-inch tape, and it'll go on for an hour and a half. The guy just went, well, Bob, this is picking up for where I left off three weeks ago, and this is what I'm thinking about now, and they're absolutely fascinating. You're listening to these absolutely knowledgeable, fascinating people for an hour, hour and a half, or two minutes. There would be that much on the tape. Just a uh, marvelous listening. But back to, uh, I said earlier that Bob was a, was a caller, but with the magazine going as crazy as it did, and having the Asilomar program, and the year after he started the Asilomar, he was approached by um, Ed Gilmore and a couple of other uh, dancers from the Riverside, California area, saying, we'd like to have a national convention. And, Bob was not on the original program. He had a booking up in, in Northern California. He could not be at the first. But uh, Bob Van Antwerp, Osa Matthews, and I'm, tr I'm trying to think of Cal Golden. Cal Golden were at the at that first. And when the the uh, 2001, the 50th anniversary came around. Uh, they had Osa Matthews calling on the same stage as she did back in 1952 for the first national. Uh, that's also when Caller Lab gave Bob the Millennium Award, the only one that will ever be honored as the caller of the 20th century. So, uh, if you would like to see that, uh, do not steal it. Because uh, my name is on the contract with the University of Denver where it's all been preserved. Uh, but Bob could no longer call squares because he could not keep up with the changes of the shift from pattern dancing to you know the mixing of the, the choreography through by calling basics. And so when he dropped out of calling, he still wanted to be on the mic. And so he started a contra dance group at the Sets and Order Hall. It was uh, the Courtly Contras, and a marvelous group. And uh, he kept that going from, I would guess, about 1970 until uh, 2002. Yeah. He still had that group going. We're getting short on time, and I wanted everybody to understand that Bob Osgood also worked heavily in the movie industry. Uh, in the 50s, early 50s, late 40s, early 50s, how many of you have watched old westerns with square dance scenes in them? 
many of those scenes were choreographed by Bob Osgood. He lived in Bel Air. His next door neighbor was uh, Gene Kelly. Uh, many of those scenes were choreographed by Bob and either called by Bob or Fenton Jones or Les Gocher. Les Gocher did uh, one of the most famous ones. Yeah. Um, Bob was involved with Pappy Shaw, who was you know, the real inspiration, and Bob would always say that Pappy was the leader. He's the only one to, to really consider as being a leader in square dance. And, but, uh, Bob also had, had a club, uh, a, a loose-knit club. Gene Kelly told him that square dancing was the best recreation he'd ever seen. And he said, Gene uh, watched Bob's television show. Yeah, Bob had a, a weekly television show in L.A. on Sunday nights. Mm -hmm. It was weekly and uh, was very popular. They wanted clean TV, uh, you know, for family type TV. It was on in the 50s. Gene Kelly dis, uh, did his rehearsals in his garage. He had a wood floor in there and he decided that they needed some uh, recreation for the movie stars, they can't mix with ordinary people because they wouldn't leave them alone. So Bob called regularly for people such as John Wayne, Gene Kelly, went to their homes and stuff. And the, uh, the movie Summer Stock with uh, Gene Kelly and... Ginger Rogers. No, not, not Ginger Rogers. Judy Garland. Judy Garland, thank you very much. The name was going to come eventually, but uh, Judy Garland, it was a, a, just a kind of a fun thing that Judy Garland ran a, a farm and every Saturday night they had the local community dance that took over the barn. Gene Kelly had a, an amateur theater group that came out and rented the farm to be able to, to rehearse and be ready to go on the road and the two conflict came, the, the country folk and the city folk all ended up in the barn with the uh, choreography that, that Bob did. They trained a caller to, to put on the show and you had the strangest mixture of Portland Fancy, if anybody knows that dance, and uh, Laces and Graces and modern tap dancing. And the, the, the theater folk come jumping down out of the hayloft to, to get out on the floor. Marvelous fun scene. Uh, Two of them. How have you seen Son-in-Law? You've seen Son-in-Law? Yeah. yeah. You've got to see it, if nothing else, then it features uh, Ernie King. Ernie King. And uh, one, one of the great comedic scenes in film is watching Ernie Kinney going into the marsh. Jumped off the stage. <laughs> Uh, I was sitting in a movie with, with my wife and I saw that Ernie came on and I said, my God, that's Ernie Kenny real loud. Everybody looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Bob choreographed a, a square dance scene for uh, the last movie that uh, Jerry Lewis and uh, Dean Martin did together. And unfortunately, the, the tension showed, but uh, it was a western, and Jerry Lewis was his usual klutzy self. And they have a square dance in the barn, or, or in a bar. And Jerry and, and Dean were going to be calling. And I cannot remember what the sequence exactly was. I think I have the script, actually. But anyway, it gets all turned inside out and upside down. And when the previews came out in the theaters, the square dance scene was there. And Bob was pushing it, you know, hey, go see the movie, you, know, you gotta see partners. But the executives at the theater measured and it was four or five minutes over the recommended time for the length of the movie to show. And so they cut out the square dancing entirely. But you can find the trailer and it has about 15 seconds of it. This brings us about to the end of the hour here, Mike. If you would, uh, I want you to you have a question first. May I make a comment? Something that I, would, I wanted everybody to know. That uh, Johnny said he was raised on a cattle ranch, which he was. Before he married, he was a professional rodeo cowboy, riding broncs. And... 
He was also one of the original members of the Board of Governors of Colorado. That's right. He was the first chairman of the Mainstream Commission. And I had the pleasure of presenting the Colorado Milestone Award to John. And some time back, an article came out in American Square Dates magazine about St uh, Stan Burdick and all of his travels. And he had been to 20 different countries around the world doing square dancing one way or another. The most travel caller in the world. And I said, no, I can trump that because I've been to 24 different countries. Well, not after Al Brundage passed away and his obituary was printed. He'd been to 37 different countries as a caller. That trumped me and left me in. Last year, Deborah and I had the opportunity to stay over an extra day here in Phoenix and we got with Johnny and Marge and had a dinner with them and talked to them. Listen to this, 57 different countries as a square dance caller. That's right. This, this brings it to a conclusion, and Mike, if you would please. I just have one more thing to say. At one of my first conventions on the Board of Governors, I was uh, flying home, and Bob and I were sitting together, Bob Osgood, and I said, and, and I was frustrated. I, I, it was my first convention on the Board, and the infighting and the bickering and the stuff that was going on on the Board was just, to me, was just, I, I couldn't believe it, you know. Uh, these were all heroes and mentors and people that, that I really respected, and I, I said to Bob, I said, I'm just just frustrated with being on the board and all the bickering and I said I said I just I just can't believe that there's not more respect amongst the callers in call lab and he said to me he said we're a young organization and he said it's uh, it's something I might not see in my lifetime but I, I I know for sure that you're gonna see it in your lifetime and I think when I look around the last several conventions that we've had that there's more mutual respect amongst each one of us, that we're all kind of in that same boat, we're all part of the same huge activity, and it's one of the most pleasing things that I think I've seen, that, that Bob's vision really came true, that there is that kind of respect uh, in this organization that uh, makes us all part of an amazing community. So, uh, let's keep it going. Yeah. Give a nice hand to Mike Seaston. Thank you very much. I want a really nice hand for Ed Foote. here for a little bit. If you'd like to have some photos, please come up. We want those back. And also, Flippo, you want to come up? Flip, they'd like to have you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being